Hello, everyone. My name is Mariana, and I'm an educator at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Welcome to our special guest research quest Q&A session. It's going to be our question and answer session for the research quest live. And today we have a special guest. Her name is Alan Erickson. She is the Citizen Science Program Coordinator at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Hello, Alan. How are you today? <laughs> Thank you so much for participating. Thanks for having me, Mariana. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you doing today? Great. Happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. That's awesome. Uh, so I was thinking that maybe you could start talking a little bit about your work and about what is citizen science for our viewers. Fabulous. That's a perfect place to start. So to introduce myself, as you said, I, I coordinate the citizen science programs at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And so the most important thing, I guess, to touch on is what is citizen science? So everyone's on the same page. Um, citizen science or a citizen scientist is basically anyone who's helping a professionally trained scientist with research in some capacity. And so frequently a citizen scientist is someone who hasn't gone to school to become a professionally trained scientist themselves, but they can still be really useful to people that have been trained. Uh, so I get to do a lot of fun work with members of the public, people just like, well, you and me who are science educators, but then of course, people who are tuning in are absolutely citizen scientists and can be. And so anybody um, who's anybody can can join in the fun. So I get to work with members of the public and collaborate with museum researchers and have people help us do research at the museum and collect collect some fun data. <laughs> That's awesome. That sounds like a really cool project. And that was going to be like one of my questions, like who can participate in this project? And like, can, for example, like students participate and like teachers maybe as well? Absolutely. So one of my favorite things about citizen science is that really anybody can be a citizen scientist. It doesn't matter what age you are, what you're interested in. Um, if you have a job, it doesn't matter what that job is, you can still be a citizen scientist. You can do citizen science from inside your home. You can do citizen science outside. So your physical abilities and your access to things like technology don't necessarily matter either. There are lots of different projects that you can engage with. And so I love that about citizen science because it's not just one thing. It's many, many, many different things. And citizen science projects really can span a whole bunch of different kinds of topics, which is a pretty cool thing. It's not just one scientific area. If you're interested in, for example, insects, you can find some really cool research projects that need citizen scientists help to study insects. Or if you're interested in birds or space, anything, <laughs> there are many, many different forms of science uh, can in need citizen science help, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's so cool. We know that a lot of people are watching, they're interested like insect. I know that a lot of people are interested in space as well because of the questions we got. So mm -hmm. can you share with us maybe like some of like the projects that we ha you have going on right now? Like uh, you, you have any projects with like, I don't know, bugs or like any other, uh, anyway, maybe birds as well. Any examples? Yeah, for <laughs> sure, exactly. So at the Natural History Museum of Utah, there are a couple fun citizen science projects that we've got going right now where anybody tuning in can help the museum collect data. Um, so there are three that I could talk about and, and a couple of them you might have already heard from if you've been tuning in to Research Quest Live earlier this week from some of the other awesome guests who've been on. Um, mm -hmm. The first one I'd, I'd love to talk about is uh, it's a project looking at an insect that Christy Bills, who's the entomologist at the museum, has probably spoke a little bit about, well, I know she spoke a little bit about earlier this week. There is an mm -hmm. introduced species of insect in Utah called firebug. It's a European firebug. Mm -hmm. European firebugs were first noticed in Utah around 2008, and they're not native to the state. So they're not really supposed to be here, but they're here now. And since they've been observed in 2008, they've really been sort of taking off um, and, and like living here, it seems. Um, so with any introduced species, it's, there's some interesting research that goes on there. And especially if it's a new kind of um, species to the area, the cool thing about European firebugs is that prior to someone observing them in Northern Utah in 2008, they had never been seen in North America at all. They had only been observed in Europe and a couple other 
uh, countries nearby. So somehow they got all the way over here and not just to the United States or North America in general, but somehow to Northern Utah, which is sort of a mystery to us. And we'll, we might not ever know how they got here, but we do know they are here, um, which is kind of cool. And I can show you a couple things about them if you're interested to maybe awesome. see the data, something that the museum uses um, for some of our citizen science project is this really cool platform called iNaturalist. And yeah, that, that'll be like one of my questions, like what is the iNaturalist? Can you talk about this with us? Well, I got the awesome that you're going to talk about this. Yeah. Fabulous. So, so I think part of being a citizen scientist is really having some tools that can be useful to you. And so really tools could be anything as simple as having a, a guidebook that tells you all about local insects or plants that you're interested in. Mm -hmm tools to be a citizen scientist could also be little maybe bug jars that you're using to catch things um, or you know even if you have other things around your house like boxes that you can just put stuff in um, to catch a bug to maybe help keep them contained so you can photograph them a little better uh, it doesn't have to be a fancy scientific tool this is just a, a, a phone box from a <laughs> phone we bought a little while ago so I'm sure you have things like that around your house that you could be right. using we well, yeah, all do <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so there's some other cool tools that, that you can use for citizen science, and some of them are, are digital platforms that people have created specifically really for citizen scientists. And so one of them is this platform called iNaturalist, and it exists online, and it's a place that is meant to capture photographs of anything wild and living. And so the gist of it is that you see something that's wild and it's alive, or it could be evidence of something that's wild or alive, like tracks or scat maybe mm -hmm. a nest. you take a photo of it and you add it to the iNaturalist platform which is free and it's easy to download and use right from your phone so I use it on my cell phone all the time when I'm outside in my yard and I see something um, maybe I know what it is maybe I don't know what it is and then I can take a photo of it and iNaturalist will help me identify what it is it's kind of like a mobile guidebook basically and it has this cool AI functionality. So there's some artificial intelligence that will look at the photo you took and it will think about what it is. And it's pretty good at identifying what you found. And so you can select um, whatever it tells you to select. Your photo will be labeled as that, that species that it's identified as a record of that that species that you found in that time in that place and so it's a pretty cool thing uh, mm -hmm. because then it gets saved to the iNaturalist platform as data and so that that insect that you just found in your yard has a record online uh, forever which really can be super useful to scientists and so the museum is using iNaturalist to track fire bugs in Utah uh, and so let me I'll pull up my yeah screen sharing button that's awesome and while i do that i want to remind everybody who's watching that if you want to leave a question for ellen just press the ask a question button for us like on the website and if you want you can also leave a comment on facebook because we are gathering all of your questions so yeah just remind everybody <laughs> sounds great and really ask ask away i may or may not know the answer to your question but i'll show i'll try <laughs> yeah, for sure but I'm happy to answer any questions people have, especially as they relate to iNaturalist or how you can be a citizen scientist at home. So on the Natural History Museum of Utah's webpage, we have a page that talks about firebugs of Utah. And so this is that landing page there. Mm -hmm. um, if you scroll down on this page, there are some fun links and videos that will help you get acquainted with what iNaturalist is. It has a picture of what a European firebug is. For those who don't know, they look really similar to a box elder bug in size and sort of in coloring. Mm -hmm. They kind of live in similar places, but the firebug has this. They, can you see my mouse when I move it around? Yes, we Fabulous. can see it. Good. It's I'm a hand talker, so it's good to have a little. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. <laughs> Um, so they've got these cool circular markings on their back, which box elder bugs do not have. And fire bugs mm -hmm. also don't fly where box elders mm. do. Um, that's really cool. And that's really interesting because if someone who's watching was also watching uh, when we had Christy Bills here, we showed the difference between them. So like we were showing like a box elder and like the pattern in like the European bug. And we could see like they're so similar, but they're like this like small differences that you can see and probably sometimes you cannot see if you don't look like really close or don't take a picture so yeah that's so cool 
It's totally right. And I think that's sort of a general tip I kind of have for somebody who's interested in being a citizen scientist and making observations on a naturalist. Just take the picture, take a picture of whatever you have. And even if you think you might know what it is, because maybe you don't. And even the, especially with insects and plants, sometimes there are small little differences in them that could maybe mean they're a different kind of species and something that we, we haven't seen yet before or something we don't really see around much. Um, so you never know what you're gonna find. So just food for thought. Um, so there's a picture of the European firebug and there's some fun um, links and videos you can click to here if you're interested in checking those out later on. Um, and then down here, it says firebugs of Utah project. And so if you click on that, it'll take you to our iNaturalist page. And so this is where any observation of a European firebug in the state of Utah that's made on iNaturalist automatically gets added here. And so there's a map and it shows who's been observing and all of these fun things. And so the thing that I think is the most interesting about European firebugs is, is their spread. And so this is an iNaturalist and a map. Uh, all these little red blobs here um, are any place in the world that a European firebug has been photographed and added to iNaturalist. And so you can see here in this green box, it says there are over 8,000 observations of European firebugs worldwide that wow. people have made. These are all individual observations of a time that somebody like you or me mm -hmm. was out on a walk or hanging out in their backyard or getting into their car and saw a firebug, took a picture of it and added it to iNaturalist as a record of that individual, um, that individual in that time and that place. So okay. cumulatively there are over 8,000, which is pretty cool. Something yeah. I love about iNaturalist is that then there's this fun sort of data searching thing. And so again, this is something anybody can do at home um, with any species that you happen to be interested in. You can search for the species up here. So I already did this for European firebug. And then you can also search for location, location. Mm -hmm. places that are existing. You can have other, you can add other fun filters to it, like specific date ranges that you're interested in and, and other mm -hmm. fun things too. Um, That's so useful for who's doing research about that. Fun. It's, it's cool. pretty fun. So I narrowed my search down a little bit here, and is I hope. Let me know if the if this is viewing kind of weird. I can always zoom in on things if you need to. Okay, no, I think we can um, see that really well. So this is a the highlight here is European firebugs in North America. So now we're not looking at observations in Europe anymore. We're looking at the ones that have been um, observed here, and so in on our continent. And so the the little red blobs are, are less, and it's not showing me the observation number right here, which is weird. And that might just be my internet, but worry not because we're gonna keep zooming in. <laughs> um, so then I can zoom in and this is just European firebugs that have been observed in the United States. And wow. in the US, there are only, uh, there are almost 500 observations total, which is pretty fascinating. Um, that's, that's something cool. that I think is really cool uh, is that a couple weekends ago, there was this international challenge happening called the City Nature Challenge. It is a pretty fun four-day event that encourages people worldwide to download iNaturalist, put it on their phones. You can also just use it on your computer and take pictures with the, with the digital camera and upload your pictures uh, from your computer as well. It encourages people to find things outside, take pictures of them, add them to iNaturalist to help create this cool record of global biodiversity. And traditionally, it's sort of a competition between different cities. And so, for example, Salt Lake City, where we are, would compete against LA and against San Francisco and against Denver and, and uh, Cape Town, South Africa, really worldwide, over 200 cities participate and see who can collect the most naturalist data in their city. Like, I have more nature in my city than you, that kind of thing. Ooh. <laughs> because right now everything is kind of crazy in the world and lots of people are hanging out at home and it's harder to get outside for a lot of people around the world. The challenge wasn't um, a competition this year. It was just sort of this global effort, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, so over the four day stretch, the, a lot of cool data was collected. Something that I was just noticing this morning when I was pulling up this map is that firebug observations are now, well, and so the story really goes with European firebugs that they were first observed, as I mentioned, in North America, in Northern Utah in 2008. 
Wow. Since then, so that was one, so picture it being one dot right in the middle of Utah. That was it at the time. Since then, obviously there are a lot more dots here along the Wasatch area. Um, mm -hmm. They've also been spotted in Idaho. So there's an observation in Boise. This is here in Southern Idaho. Um, they've also been observed a few times in Mexico and also Canada. Mm -hmm. But this week, this past weekend with the City Nature Challenge, there was one observation made here in Los Angeles. And there was another one made down here in Miami, Miami. Um, which is crazy. And so that's yeah. sort of awesome. That's because um, that means that firebugs are in other places too. Yeah. And something I think that's really interesting about all of this is that um, iNaturalist is not the only, like this isn't the only record of these bugs, if that makes sense. Like firebugs mm -hmm. exist in lots of places that iNaturalist doesn't know about because iNaturalist depends on citizen scientists taking photos and adding them. So mm -hmm. as a someone who has a job like me, I find this really interesting because this shows us areas of interest, like say around Los Angeles or in Florida, where mm -hmm. it turns out there might be populations of these insects we didn't know about. And so now that's, those are places that we can maybe start to direct uh, some of our outreach to people to say, hey, it looks like they might be in your area. Keep an eye out um, and look for them more, which is pretty cool. That's so um, cool. And, and like, I saw that like, a, there are almost like 500 like um, observations in the United States, but I think like, as I, uh, we could see in like in your other tab, I think more than 300 that are, they are like in Utah, right? So that's exactly right. And I, sorry, I just came back on so we could, <laughs> Want to be? I didn't want to be boring you with my screen, but I'll go back to it because yes, For most sure. of those observations have been made in, in Utah, and as I mentioned, that's because that's where they first showed up, and so um, that's also where the museum has been putting our efforts into getting the word out to say, "Hey, help us look for firebugs." And so the more people know that we want to have photographs of these things added to our naturalist, the more they take photos of them. And so these are the observations that have been made in Utah to date, um, and yeah, most of them. These account for most of the observations in the United States. Something I think is super interesting also that observations don't go any farther north than Logan in Utah. Mm. And actually these observations in Logan are happened in May of this year, oh. uh, in April of this year too. And so they, wow. so those are pretty new. Yeah, uh, pretty new. That, but before that, the farthest north we had ever seen uh, firebugs in, in Utah, at least on iNaturalist was Ogden. Um, and then same with the Southern ranges down here, just past Spanish Fork, there are some cool observations that people saw in, in Payson, Utah. And so that's crazy. So if you happen to be oh. in and you live kind of on the outskirts of this map, yeah. keep an eye out for firebugs and take pictures of uh, them for us when you see them and put them on because it's pretty cool to see how their range is kind of expanding. And it we don't it really is. About them, like, are they, like, we don't know if they're, how they're impacting the ecosystem here. We mm -hmm. don't know how they impact, say, um, box elder bugs, for example. And so step yeah. one, kind of learning more about the, how they're impacting Utah is knowing where they are. <laughs> so we know. Exactly. And these observations, they, they can help us like probably know in the future how they can impact. And that's so cool because it was, uh, it was, I saw that, that that final, like that more South, like observation happened like in April 26th. Yeah. And that's really interesting because I think I was watching when you were in our Q and A last time. And I remember that, that you were showing that there were no like observations like south than like Spanish Fork. And now we are seeing that they're coming, like we're, we're seeing like a spread, that's so cool. Yeah, so they're, they're around and it, so it really is interesting. And so it, it, especially with some species that are introduced like that, it's, it's exciting because they are changing all the time. And so it's a great example of how you at home can help the museum and really science in general learn more about things because it's impossible for museum researchers to be everywhere to make observations like this. And, and Christy Bills talks about that when she, she also has a really cool citizen science project looking at fireflies in the state of Utah. Fireflies are, are a native species. They're supposed to be here, um, but we don't, also don't know much about them. And they have a pretty limited time of year that they're around and that you can see them. And so again, Christy is one person and her team is pretty small. And so the state of mm -hmm. Utah is pretty big and actually fireflies are not just in Utah they're also in Colorado and Idaho and Nevada yeah 
Mexico as well. And so there's no way in a, in a two month period that fireflies are out flashing at night that Christy could go observe all those places um, during a small research window. And so she depends on citizen scientists being her eyes. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you in advance for everyone out there who's helping the museum with some of this cool research. Yeah, that's 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 so important because we also got here like Austin Green like talking about like like helping with the project and like taking pictures. Jamie Butler was here also talking about like cameras and like uh, taking pictures of like birds in the Great Salt Lake. So that's that's awesome, and that really ties with one of the questions I got. Um, Joshua from Washington is asking, how can people use iNaturalist right now in the, our situation now? Ooh, so like meaning when we're all at home? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a good question, Joshua. There are lots of ways that you could be using iNaturalist now. As I mentioned, the City Nature Challenge was a fun thing that happened a couple weeks ago. And so people worldwide were using iNaturalist um, to, to sort of engage with nature. I So feel free to ask a follow-up question if I don't get at what you're wanting to know about. But for me, iNaturalist, I think is... There are a lot of there's several cool things that you could be doing now. One is just getting outside in any way you can, if you can, to take photos of nature that's nearby you. Um, as I mentioned, that's helpful for adding. It, it's kind of like adding one tiny puzzle piece to this this big puzzle of global biodiversity. And even if it's something that you see outside all the time, like a robin, or um, a, a box elder bug, or something, a squirrel. Mm -hmm. That's still helpful data um, because it's still helpful data because you, mm -hmm. ne like, you never know what you're going to find. And knowing about the things that are living in our cities in general are pretty helpful because creatures that live in sort of urban settings aren't always studied very much. And so we don't always know about what's living around us. Um, and the benefits to that are one, it helps to contribute data to iNaturalist, but then also sort of selfishly as the observer it's, it's really, it's fun to get out and find things to take pictures of. I find that iNaturalist for me on a, on a weekly basis is a really good way for me to be inspired to go outside, even just around my home and to look for things to take pictures of. It kind of helps me slow down. I'm looking under rocks. I'm looking at spots around my garage where maybe I know some things might be found. Um, and I and then I kind of slow down and wait for things to come out and so I can take pictures of them. It's a pretty fun thing for me. And I think especially now while people are sort of home um, and, and not engaging um, with a lot of other humans, mm -hmm. it's a really great way to be connected to the natural world. And the more you're interacting with nature, um, I think the better off you are. And it really, there are studies that show it's, it's a healthy practice to be engaging with nature in some capacity. And so that's healthy mentally and also physically. Yeah, so, for okay. sure. Plus then you get to learn about fun stuff that's around you. And really things don't have to be outside. We have nature in our homes too. And so there are spiders that live in your house. And this might be a, a fun time to sort of see if you can find them and photograph them as best you can and put them on my naturalist. And I will admit that I've not always been a big fan of spiders and they kind of give me the willies <laughs> sometimes, but the more that I've used my naturalist, <laughs> the more that I've used my naturalist, the more comfortable I am with them. And you start to get interested, like, what is this creature? And then you learn more about what they do. Um, wolf, a wolf spider is a, is a common spider you can find um, all over the, the mm -hmm sort of around homes, especially, and they sometimes can look kind of big and they're freaky, but mm -hmm. wolf spiders, turns out, are kind of cool roommates to have because they they eat other insects that you maybe don't want to have around your house, and they yeah. are not harmful to people. Yeah. They might sort of look a little different. Um, yeah. Anyway, I mean, so like, it might help you learn and appreciate things that you live by, too, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Um, and then and I Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking a lot and I'm sorry that if I am No, don't worry. No, we, we, we wanna hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> Another fun thing that you could be doing on iNaturalist from home is helping make identifications of observations that have been already made. And so another amazing thing about iNaturalist is that it's this community of people online. And so it's still a really fun way to be connecting with people in a digital way, talking about science. And so as I mentioned, it has this AI functionality. So you take a picture, it gets uploaded. Um, 
so say I find, say I'm in my yard and I say picture, I see a ladybug and I, I add that ladybug to my naturalist and, I, and the AI tells me that it thinks it's a seven spotted ladybug. There are lots of different kinds of ladybugs. And so that's what I post it as. And maybe it's not actually a seven spotted ladybug. Maybe it's a two spotted ladybug. Mm-hmm. Other people on iNaturalist will see that and they can help me identify that better. And so someone could say, actually, it's this other kind of species. Um, and so there's a cool conversation that's sort of happening. And so if you're somebody that happens to know about species, like maybe you know some things about birds or about insects or plants, you can go on iNaturalist and look at observations people have made mm-hmm. and help verify that they took a picture of a certain thing. And so that's a pretty fun thing to do too, if you know about topics. You can really yeah. help people um, meet with their observations. And then that, those observations then become scientific quality research. Yeah, I was, I was going to say like that, that's really cool for like exploring home or like if you're you know hike or like in a walk uh, with like your social distance, you can you can pay more attention to like the place where you are and like learn more. And if you if you feel like totally at home, you can also like explore a little bit in iNaturalist and learn more about it, like other tools and like maybe help other people. That's that's awesome. And I was going to uh, connect this with a question that we got. Uh, Lawrence from Wyoming is asking, what tools do you need for iNaturalist? And connected to that, I was going to ask you if you could maybe share with us, like maybe in your screen or something like it, how do people do it? How do people use iNaturalist? How can they can like upload it, like a picture and uh, and maybe like, uh, like ask if it's like, if that it's that species really that they are seeing or so like, yeah, that, I think that'd be really useful for everybody to watch how, how to do it. Very cool, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, so I, so great question and nice nice to have Wyoming tuning in today too. Uh, <laughs> keep an eye out for, for fireflies out that way this summer, you guys. <laughs> they, start, they start flashing now, May through, May through June and they start to, you can see them around 10 p.m. And they like to be around mm-hmm. wet places. There's more info on the museum's web, or the Natural History Museum's website if you want to read about it. Mm-hmm. Um, related to your question, um, with iNaturalist and tools that are helpful for iNaturalist, the the main tool that you need to be um, make successful observations on iNaturalist is a camera of some capacity. And as I mentioned, your phone is fabulous for that. And ninety. No, 100% of the photos that I add to iNaturalist were taken with my phone. Some people really love to take pictures with with digital cameras and add them later, and it is completely Mm -hmm. up to you to decide on what works best. Um, Anyway, so there are different options with with that. You don't have to have a photo to add an observation to iNaturalist. You can see something, and if you don't have a camera with you, you can still report that you saw it. Um, and it would only be counted as a casual observation, which means it could never become research, quote, research quality grade. But if you thought, saw something you thought would be really helpful to share on the platform, um, that's possible. But the whole point of iNaturalist is that you need to have visual proof, essentially, of, of the thing mm-hmm. you're seeing for people to verify it is what it is. Mm-hmm. You can also add audio files to iNaturalist as well. Um, and so if you hear a bird, you can record it using a voice memo on your phone uh, and then add that to the site. And so I've done that sometimes too when it's you know the early morning and it's dark out and I hear birds singing, you can record that and add it. And I'd, I've actually learned more about what birds are singing in my yard because of that. <laughs> um, so that's so audio files is another thing. The big thing about audio files is you can't upload an audio file from your phone. It has to be from the computer. So that's some that's getting into some super detail. And I'm happy to talk with people about that at a later date. So mm-hmm. if you have um, questions about iNaturalist that span beyond this program, my contact information is on the Natural History at the Natural History Museum of Utah's website um, on our citizen science pages. You'll see my name there and you can email me questions. But let's talk about some making an observation on iNaturalist. I like that. Um, so I actually have a, I have a little story that I'll tell you as I do it. Um, we love stories here. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, you want like the best thing to do is add a, add a photo to iNaturalist. And so um, when you're doing that, it's important to remember that the best photo you can get is the best kind of data. So the more detailed your photo is, the more easy it is to identify the species. Of course, sometimes you cannot get a great photo. And so don't get hung up on getting 
an amazing magazine quality photo. Mm -hmm. But think about trying to get the best photo you can. Um, so yesterday, actually, I was out on a walk and I have been noticing a bunch of insects lately inside of these big cotton thistles. They're pretty oh. pokey thistles. And um, ladybugs like to hang out in them, I've noticed over the past couple of weeks. And so I found a ladybug. So here's a picture that I took right away. When I see something, I just get my camera out and I take a picture as quick as I can, because sometimes <laughs> It's there and then it's gone. This one was sort of having a little bit of a nap initially. So I was trying to get a little closer to take a better photo. So at first glance, it looks like this ladybug has four spots. Uh, As I mentioned, there are lots of different kinds of ladybugs and this, their spot pattern is useful in identifying which specific species it is. So here's this ladybug. His head is down here. So we're looking uh, at it back end. Um, so it looks like it's got four spots. Then this ladybug, uh -huh. Uh, moved and he after this started to move around a lot and we really wanted to get a photo of him and so from the side view so his head is here this is his right side or its right side I should say um, we don't know the gender <laughs> uh, it's got looks like it's got three spots here on this side now and then there's this other white spot you know in I know that this is the sun reflecting on it, but anyway, that could be confusing for people. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so he moved and so there's the right side, he's got those three spots and then he kept moving around again. So this is his left side. So you can see those same three oh. spots are on this side. Mm -hmm. And then he's got one here in the middle. And so you can sort of do some math and visually compile all those together. That means that this ladybug has seven spots on it. Mm -hmm. And then he finally turned and was sort of facing me to say hello. <laughs> um, uh, but so none of those pictures show all angles of the ladybug and, there, and so it's not like I can in one picture capture everything and so you can take more than one picture of at different angles to kind of understand mm -hmm. what that insect looks like and so I can add each one of those pictures to my naturalist in one observation of that species mm -hmm. so if I go to let's see if I can find my link that I preloaded <laughs> it's okay uh, while I do that, I'm going to remind everybody who's watching that if you want to leave a question for Ellen, just press the ask a question button or leave a comment on Facebook for us. <laughs> awesome. Uh, that ladybug was really cute. <laughs> hey, ladybugs are pretty fun. I do love ladybugs. I love them. So here we go. Sorry, I'm finding my... It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> And this was your last update, like the last time you, you put something on iNaturalist? Um, uh, yes, actually. And so I, I did, I added this this morning um, to iNaturalist. Just a fresh so one. <laughs> yes, I'm showing you my sort of observations page. And so this is what it looks like when you <gasps> look at the observations that are made. And so this, those pictures I just showed you, I added to iNaturalist this morning. And you can see here already somebody in the iNaturalist community saw what I posted. And it's got this green tag on it, which says research grade, mm -hmm. which means the person agreed with my classification. So I can click on the observation here. And here's that last picture I shared with the, um, the, with the, the head on shot. And then I added these other pictures of the different angles um, to the same observation. Uh. And so those are all the, so that helps kind of prove why I'm saying I think this is a seven spotted ladybug. And then it helps other people who are logging oh. on to, to agree. And so this user here agreed with that. Pretty cool, right? And really I posted yeah, that under good. less than an hour. So this is all within the past hour, somebody's come in and said, yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, cool. If I wanted, and this kind of shows some of the functionality a little bit better. If I came in and I was a different user, you could suggest a different, identification and I could do this for my own one too and if I touch this box here this is the AI functionality giving me different suggestions and so they're saying for sure it's in this genus of ladybugs um, and mm -hmm. then specifically these are the species that they think it could be and it'll tell you that it's visually similar and it's and if it's been spotted already it's something that's been spotted nearby and sometimes that can be helpful when you're trying to identify um, yeah. And then you can go into all these different links. It'll show you detailed video pictures of, of observations. Like I said, this is kind of like a mobile guidebook or like a digital guidebook. And so it'll help you um, mm -hmm. 
you can kind of just decide what it is you're trying to look at. Anyway, so that's a pretty fun, pretty fun thing. From the the main page of well, so that's another one I preloaded. I can show you that in a minute. Maybe I'll show you um, just the main iNaturalist site. So that when I log on, this is what I see automatically. It's everybody that I'm following and observations that have been made. Uh, that's that's so cool. it gets to this global map that I was showing you earlier. So when we're looking at firebugs, um, this lists every observation that's ever been made on iNaturalist, which is wow. Many. Um, and then this is where you can search specific stuff. If I want to make an observation or upload a picture that I've taken, all you have to do is touch this green upload button here. Mm -hmm. and you can drag your photos or your audio files there. And so I did that for another ladybug picture that I took yesterday because they were all over this cactus, I'm telling you, or this thistle, all over this thistle. Um, and so associated with the photo that I took on my phone, which I then added to my computer, the, the metadata, uh, the information of my, of the date and the time that it was taken are, is are automatically saved with the photo I took on my phone. So that gets added automatically. Uh, the location was also added. So you can see where I was in my hike here, um, <laughs> here in Salt Lake City. And so that also is automatically saved from my phone. So the only thing I need to do is give it a species name. Uh. So, if I don't have any idea what this is, like I, I'm like, oh, this is some kind of beetle. Like I said, the artificial intelligence will give me some ideas. And so at the, at the minimum, it's giving me the genus level. So the sort of overarching idea that it lives within this specific um, classification of insects. And then- It's going to help you with some suggestions. Well, like, it's, yeah. It's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. So again, I know this one that I have a picture of here is a seven spotted lady beetle. This is a different picture that I took where you can, and it, this is I know it's so small, I'm so sorry, I can show you bigger soon. Okay. If it was doing something cool, like if I was eating an aphid, I could say eating aphid on the, oh, on the floor, right? You could so add this cool. description about what it's doing if you wanted. Otherwise, I'll, sit, I'll hit submit and it's gonna save that observation. Oh. Um, and so then it'll get added to the, the list of things. And so now I've got, um, this is the one we were looking at earlier with the pictures that I was mm -hmm. showing you up close. Um, and then the one that I just added, which has only been on for seconds, so no one else has had a chance to observe it yet. And, and um, uh. this is an old one, sorry. I was like, somebody did. Um, yeah. Or is this the one that I just added? I think this is really the one I just added. Yeah, yeah so I think somebody it is. Coming in has already helped me identify this. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, anyway. Whoa. So that's someone is really knows about thing. ladybugs. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I've learned a lot of things about birds that live by my house that I thought were one thing, and I thought like, we've got mourning doves here in Salt Lake City. We've got uh, Eurasian collared doves here, and they look kind of similar from a distance. And because of iNaturalist, I've learned how to tell the difference between those species. And so it's, it's really fun how it's been helping my, my naturalist skills. Sure, fun because it, it makes this whole process of like, like walking and seeing like so more fun because you can see like so many different things you pay attention to so many different details. It's so, so cool. So right. amazing, thank you for sharing. <laughs> and I, I have a question here that, oh, this one is really, it's really interesting. Avery in Salt Lake City is asking, have uh, there been any surprising discoveries for you in iNaturalist? So surprising discoveries, certainly. And I think for, for me personally, there have been some fun things that I've just learned that like, oh, that lives in my yard or that lives nearby. Or um, I, like I said, there's some birds that I was like, oh, that's definitely what that is. And because of iNaturalist observations that, um, that I've made and learned that I made them wrong, other people helped me identify them correctly. Like now I know what a, a European starling looks like, whereas I did not before, which is pretty fun. Um, in, the, in the world of iNaturalist, some pretty amazing things have happened since it's, it was created by some developers in California. People have identified and photographed species that people have never seen before, all because of the iNaturalist platform. 
um, in, in the state of Utah, still we find first records of species here um, because of iNaturalist observations. Even from this past City Nature Challenge, we had three, um, three, well, so during, I, I know I keep mentioning the City Nature Challenge, we had almost 7,000 observations that people in Utah made during the City Nature Challenge a couple of weekends wow. ago. And from that, we have at least three species that were first records on iNaturalist. Um, Two, two of spiders and one of one of the really tiny microscopic um, uh, little cell thing. I'm blanking on it. I <laughs> That's really you're interested, um, but cool stuff. And so there's there's still sort of stuff to find out there, which is interesting. And iNaturalist also is really helpful in helping us learn about introduced species. And so I've definitely been surprised by the spread of firebug, European firebugs in Utah, um, and how mm -hmm. iNaturalist is helping us keep tabs of that. Um, another introduced species that the Natural History Museum studies is a mammal called the fox squirrel, which is Ooh. an introduced species. That squirrel, it's, they're introduced to Northern Utah. They've also been around for a little over 10 years in, um, in Northern Utah and they're spreading as well. Um, and so <laughs> always new fun observations that are kind of popping up um, of them yeah. in, in interesting places yeah. doing some cool stuff. Yeah, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about the fox squirrel, but I was going to also ask like who is watching. If you want to like share with us, like if you've ever like participating in a citizen science project, maybe like if you ever like use an na iNaturalist, like what like is your favorite thing to blow there? Or if you've never used it, but if, if you like, if you see a lot of ladybugs, for example, in your home, like or when you're walking, or if you see a fox squirrel, like share with us, uh, you can click the ask a question button, you don't have to ask a question but if you want to share with us like some uh some like animals or some bugs that you're seeing that are really interesting like in your home we would like to know as well that's that would be really cool and then totally. you can start with <laughs> awesome. i agree uh, I was yes. mm -hmm. oh sorry <laughs> i'm gonna say especially if people are psyched or have squirrels in their yard that they want to tell us about i think any kind of tree squirrel or, or ground squirrel that you happen to see in your yard, uh, we I'm really interested in that. So that would be a fun thing to hear from from viewers today. Yeah, that's really really cool. Uh, and like, if you can talk a little bit more about like the fox squirrel, like like a, like what it, like you can tell us like about is is it a project also like for the museum to get, get some pictures? Yes. So we do um, use iNaturalist again to track fox squirrels in in Utah. And they are, um, for people who don't know or haven't been seeing them around, or maybe you've been seeing them and you don't know about it, uh, fox squirrels are, as I said, introduced and they're, they're pretty big as far as squirrel yeah. species go. They have big bushy tails, sort of orange fur on their bellies, and they're really, um, mm -hmm. they're really charismatic and old. And so they're, they're running around trees a lot and they're chirping, they're, talking to people and they're mad at dogs and cats and they're fighting with rats and they're they're really um they're pretty out there and the name i've seen them <laughs> yeah, i'm sure so they're, they're really all around um salt lake city definitely and they're kind of starting to expand to other mm -hmm. other parts of the state and i can show you the our iNaturalist map here in a few minutes um the native tree squirrel species here is the is the red squirrel. I, again, I'm looking here at our, our fox squirrel page on the Natural History Museum's website. Um, red squirrels are a native tree squirrel species to northern Utah, and they're smaller. They have white coloring on their on their bellies, and so they look very different from the fox squirrel. Um, the other native species of squirrel oh, that lives here is called the rock squirrel. They're, they're a ground squirrel species. Mm -hmm. and so these guys aren't really in trees much at all. Um, they are sort of similar sizes to fox squirrels, but they don't have the same kind of orange coloring. They've got some white markings around their eyes, um, which is interesting. So the, the iNaturalist project um, that's tracking fox squirrels has a lot of observations that we've made and there we get some awesome pictures that come in if you, if you can see here they're like they're they're pretty acrobatic so they're jumping around and um, oh. they're doing fun stuff and they're always at people's bird feeders uh, and so we're, we're really interested in learning learning more about fox squirrels because we don't again know much about them here mm -hmm. in utah 
and what their impact is on the ecosystem here. We don't know how they're uh, how they're making an impact on the native squirrel species mm -hmm. um, or other, other species that live here. Um, so the first step to learning more about them is understanding, like I said, with firebugs, where they are and where, where they are. Yeah. The researchers at the museum can then go find these populations and look for nests and observe behavior. Um, and for anyone who's interested in, in fox squirrels, really in the next month or so, the museum will be coming out with some additional citizen science research that you can be doing from home this summer, helping Ooh. us collect data about fox squirrels. Uh, right now, the, the best way you can give us data is taking a picture really of any squirrel you see in Utah, mm -hmm. and just putting it on iNaturalist. That's mm -hmm. the best way to let us know about what you're seeing and, and to be a citizen scientist. Uh, and soon I'll have some other fun stuff announced that you can help, um, some other ways you can collect data in some different, some different ways about squirrels in your yard. Anyway, so squirrels are pretty fun and they, but, and they're yeah. interesting and people really do love them or they really hate them. And I kind of like that about squirrels too. <laughs> so people yeah, that's, people that's have a passion one way or the other. Um, yeah. But this is the opposite. These are the only observations of, of squirrels and yeah. fox squirrels in Utah. And you can see that again, it's kind of a similar range to what the European fire bug has. Yeah. I mean, they haven't been spotted north of Ogden or, or really mm -hmm. south of, of Provo Spanish Fork area is as far south as they go. Um, but there are a lot so of observations. Again, if you're, lots of observations. And so if you are somebody who lives in, um, like I said, any squirrel observation in Utah is interesting to us. But if you're somebody who lives mm -hmm. sort of on the edge of where fox squirrels are being observed, even here in Southern Salt Lake around Sandy, um, kind of heading up into the, the cottonwoods. Like we don't really have a lot of observations in those places. And so if you can, it can safely get out and make observations of squirrels in some of these areas, we don't have observations. That's very that's interesting very, and helpful. That's us. very interesting. Yeah, they're, I pulled up they're some, really interesting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. well, I have some other maps too. Of the of other local squirrels, but we don't have to get into that right now unless people have questions about it. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah, I was gonna say like I also think like how squirrels are interesting. I think they're really cute, but where I am from, we don't have squirrels. So when I see them here, I find them really, really cute. But like people sometimes are like I don't like them. I'm like, why? They look so cute, but I can understand like if like you, we don't know for fox squirrels specifically the impact that they have. So. It is important to know, and that's why I invite everybody who's like watching to maybe take some pictures, upload them like an iNaturalist, or share with us. Like if you if you've seen one, like let, let us know. Press the ask a question button and let us know if you've seen them, or leave a comment on Facebook for us. Uh, let me see. Oh, one of the questions that we got was like uh, some people they were asking how long you've been a citizen science scientist yourself. I think that's a pretty cool question. <laughs> That's a good question. And this this came up when I was chatting with, with Aiden several weeks ago when we were talking about citizen science. And I was, I think she and I were both agreeing that we 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 both feel like we've been citizen scientists for maybe longer than we even necessarily realized we have been. I think uh, when I think about you know my my interest in the natural world and science in general um, has, has always been part of my life. And so professionally, I ended up taking an education route. And so I do a lot of science education as part of my job. Um, and so I, I didn't go into formal scientific training on topics like I was maybe originally planning to do. Um, instead, I kind of took a route of mm -hmm. being able to talk um, about science in, in some broad ways. Is the connection still working okay for you on, on your end? I'll keep talking because I think. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, just to it's make working. Sure. It's working. Don't worry. Um, uh, so, yeah, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, it's we were. being we, a little listen. weird for me, but we'll just, mm -hmm. just power through. Okay, good. Um, so, okay. <laughs> I think being a citizen scientist really part of part of it. Part of it is just sort of observing what's around you. And so, step one is observe what you've got living around you or, or things that you're interested in. Um, and so I've been doing that for a long time, but I think also to be a formal citizen scientist, you know, to contribute to specific research projects, I've really only been doing that, I'd say the past five to 10 years, um, like contributing to active research projects. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's so that's so cool. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's see. I have a question. Um, Bonnie in Florida is asking if you could do a city nature challenge not in South Lake, where would you go? Oh, that's a really good question. Oh, that is a good question. Well, so I, I mean, okay, so the City Nature Challenge happens worldwide and Florida definitely participated. Um, and so I, mm -hmm. so, so that's food for thought. Um, and for it really, I think there are so many places in the world that getting cool pictures of iNaturalist are, are, are interesting. And so for me, things that, places that I find interesting are places that I don't know as much about. And so there are lots of places in Africa that would be amazing to see pictures of, of the biodiversity there, pictures around rainforests. Talk about biodiversity. There's a lot of amazing stuff there and you know one of the the areas that or the cities that participates in the city nature challenge is cape town south africa and they they every year the past two years have had over thirty thousand observations come through in four days with their local populations and like i said in utah we had about seven thousand so there are a lot more observations coming through cape town it's a bigger population but also they live in a totally different climate than we do here in utah and they've got this whole coastal ecosystem and so not only can they take pictures of things that are living on land and in the sky but they can take pictures of things living in the ocean and so that like the so there's an amazing amount of biodiversity there that's so cool. <laughs> it seems like a lot of things to take pictures. <laughs> uh, I have a question uh, from Colorado, Annette. She's asking, uh, have people used the data to make uh, GIS maps, GIS maps uh, to observe animal patterns or migrations? Or G well, so, oh. GIS. GIS, <laughs> GIS maps, I'm sorry. <laughs> So my guess is yes, but I don't know of specific examples to tell you about. iNaturalist really is just sort of one example of some, some ways that data is collected. And as, as we know, not you know a comprehensive record of species. And so it's a useful tool. And for me in my own work, a big part of what we use iNaturalist for is to help sort of with an outreach component. And so it sort of helps us understand maybe some areas that are of interest for us. It helps maybe showcase some potential um, holes in data. So places that where we don't, we're not collecting data yet and maybe where we should try to. Um, and then it's a really fun way to get the community involved and excited and, and actively contributing to something. Um, but then of course, as it goes to, to mapping other species data, other, other tools like GIS and other, and other scientific resources that are available to, to scientists are, are awesome. And especially, uh, anyway, so they're, they're good things to sort of add into this, but I'm sorry, I don't have specific examples of projects no, that we're using. I know with GIS. That's okay, but thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning. <laughs> uh, and I got, we got this really cool question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, Arthur in Salt Lake City is asking, has iNaturalist helped preserve any species and or has it helped protect any land areas from data? That's a really wonderful question. And the answer again is yes. And I bet if you spend a little bit of time Googling that, you might find some cool stories from other places. I can tell you mm -hmm. here in Salt Lake City, uh, the Natural History mm -hmm. Museum runs a program summertime called Salt Lake City Neighborhood Naturalists. And Neighborhood Naturalists is designed to get people out in the parks that are nearby their houses that they maybe don't know about or don't connect with much and to showcase that those parks are also places that wild things are living. And so we host BioBlitz events at these parks during the summer. And so basically we get a bunch of people together uh, with phones and with tablets and with, with other cameras and we walk around different city parks and take photos of every wild living thing that we can find. And then we add that to iNaturalist as a record of all the cool stuff living in a park. And so there are some um, threatened species of dragonfly that were identified to live in one of the city parks in Salt Lake called the Fife Wetlands. Um, so some citizen scientists during a Bible, let's took pictures of some, some of these dragonflies, 
had no idea what they were, added them to my naturalist, and then we later realized that they were a threatened species. And because of that, the city, which does a lot of management of parks, specifically with plants um, and, and weed populations, they spray often for, for weeds, um, and they were able to stop spraying weeds in the park, and now they hand pull weeds instead. And hand pulling weeds is much more um, friendly to insect populations. And so when there's a threatened species of insect, you want to help protect them as much as you can. And so pulling weeds is better. And so that's a great example of citizen science helping to change some practices for the better. That, that's a great, great example. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, and um, I have a question from Danny from Seattle is asking, what was the biggest event day in iNaturalist and how many people participated that day? You talked about the city challenge one, but is this like one of the biggest events for, for the iNaturalist or, or do you have like any other examples? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the City Nature Challenge, as far as I know, is one of the biggest um, sort of events that feed data into iNaturalist. And so this year, there were, it, it, the challenge happened from April 24th to the 27th. So it was a four day period. Over 244 cities took part. Um, Salt Lake City joined in, in in this big super project we call the Wasatch. So it included um, eight different counties. So Cache County, Utah County, uh, Wasatch County and, and many others um, joined us in this. And over that four day period, over 800,000 observations were made on iNaturalist of more than 32,000 species, which is pretty amazing. It was uh, like 40,000 people wow. participated uh, by taking pictures, um, which is amazing and so that's that's a pretty fun thing but iNaturalist is a year-round event uh, it, it's a it, you know it's 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 a platform that's working all the time and so the the city nature challenge is a fun way to kind of get people inspired to, to use it and maybe log on who haven't before um, but really it's kind of I think of the city nature challenge going on all the time in a way because you know we're always collecting biodiversity data. And so anytime you make an observation and you put it on a list, that's helpful. That's, that's awesome. And we are almost out of time, but I have a final question for you. Uh, you have a lot of observations in your naturalist account, but do you have a favorite observation that you've done? Uh, I got this question a couple weeks ago, and I think that maybe my, my observation um, is the same. My favorite observation is the same, which is a, a picture that okay. I took of a, of a, a red squirrel, which is oh, a, okay. the American red squirrel, the native tree squirrel species in Utah, that I took up at the, it was up at the state capitol a couple weeks ago where when all of the cherry trees were blooming and it was beautiful and there was this little squirrel hanging out in the tree kind of it seemed like he was also enjoying the blossoms <laughs> up at the capitol and so <laughs> I felt um, he just was kind of waiting for me to take a picture of him. oh that's so that's cool and it's hard sometimes to take pictures of them because they move really really fast so like that's so that's so cool thank you exactly so much right. for sharing <laughs> so we are out of time now for our Q&A. So I would like to say thank you so much, Alan, for participating. This was so cool. And thank you so much for sharing like how this stories and all these pictures, I think was really helpful for everybody who's at home and wanna be a citizen science and help. Let's go. <laughs> Um, thanks for letting me join and thanks everybody for being a citizen scientist with the museum this summer or wherever you live. You can still contribute to awesome science happening in your area. So thanks to you guys. <laughs> thank you. And for everybody who's watching, thank you so much for being here and watching our Q&A session. Uh, next uh, Monday, we are going to have classes again with Aiden. They're going to be amazing. We're going to have an, a new investigation, a climate investigation, and 9.30 uh, a.m. Uh, Mountain Daylight Time. And thank you so much. Bye.